some time ago, someone basically told me and my wife that we were going to hell for not homeschooling our children. Um, they used the words of Jesus, which said, if you cause one of these little ones to stumble, it's better for you to have a millstone tied around your neck. And they said, you know, basically, look, you're causing your children to stumble by not doing this and insinuated that we were going to be going to hell. That's, that's what that insinuates. Um, sometime after that, some people were praying for us, praying that we would see the light and we would homeschool our children. And it was almost like just suddenly a light switch just turned on. And it was like, of course we need to homeschool our children. You know, what were we thinking? Of course, this makes perfect sense. Okay, let's do it. And it was just, it was just instant. It was like a light switch just came on and we just saw it clearly. But now think about it if before then, if, if somebody would have said, oh, you're not homeschooling your, your children. Okay, you know what? We're, we're just going to cast you out. We're, we're, you know, we, we, can't, we can't have our children associate with your children or, um, you know, hey, you're walking by the flesh. You're in sin. We can't associate with you. And they just would have cast us out. They would have been casting out two people with, with a true heart for the Lord, wanting to serve the Lord and honor Him. Where's the love and the long suffering in that? Uh, years ago, actually, when I first became a Christian, the Lord put it on my heart to adopt. And over the years, I guess, I guess I just hardened my heart towards it. And I got to the point where I just didn't want to do it. I, I was completely against it. I was, you know, had all these excuses. I was like, well, you know, what if I don't love the, the child like I do my own? And, um, and I just started becoming closed off to it. Well, somebody must have been praying for us because it, it was just like, my, my wife wanted to do it, but it was just like, all of a sudden, she showed me a, a video, a video about uh, Chinese girls uh, being adopted and the need for that. And it was like night and day. Again, it was like a light switch just came on. And it was like, boom, it was like, of course, we need to adopt. Okay, how do we do this? Like, let's do it. I mean, it was just night and day. Like just a few minutes before, I was like, no, 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 we're not going to do that. And then it was like, just suddenly, the Lord just gave me light, and just, it was like a switch that just flipped on. And it was like, oh, of course, what were we thinking? Okay, let's go ahead and do this. How do we start? Let's get, let's get it rolling. You know, let's start thinking about this. Let's talk about it. I mean, it, it was just, I know it was God, because only God can do that. I mean, only God can just flip somebody's heart around like that so instantly. But again, I've heard people basically condemn other people for not adopting. Um, you know, this is, uh, think about it. Paul never adopted that we know of. Okay. Would, would you go around condemning Paul? Oh, you know, Hey, James says, this is true religion that we care for widows and orphans. So, Hey, have you adopted a child? Oh, well, Hey, you must be sinning. Um, Hey, you're on your way to hell. No, Paul didn't adopt any children. Why? Because the Lord had something else for him to do. Now, he may have given to help uh, you know, orphans and widows and that sort of thing, but as far as we know, he didn't adopt any, because likely because that would have hindered his sharing the gospel. I mean, we don't really know why, but not everybody did. And going around condemning people for it, oh, hey, hey, you must not really be on fire for the Lord, you're not adopting. I mean, there are people out there that basically insinuate you're going to hell if you're, if you're not adopting. But this, again, where's the long-suffering? Where's the love in this? Where is the righteous judgment? Uh, years ago, again, when I first came to Christ, I, I'd gone to a liberal college before, and uh, actually, I was, I was going to this liberal college when I became a Christian, and I'd been going you know, at least a couple years before, which was enough time for them to soundly indoctrinate me with all sorts of liberal ideas. And so it was just so ingrained in my mind. I thought I had the truth. I thought that uh, the liberals had it all figured out, and they were the, the party that was helping the poor and the marginalized. And I thought, man, this is, this is the way to go, because that's all the teachers were, were feeding me was this, you know, this liberal mindset. And now, listen, I'm not about a particular party. Um, Jesus said that his 
that his kingdom is not of this world. And it's the same for us. Our kingdom is not of this world. We're not supposed to be so involved in politics and, and the, uh, the events and things of this world, okay? We belong to a, to a country. We're sojourners in this, uh, in this world. Our country is a country in heaven. So I'm not promoting a, a certain political party, but I prayed to God and asked him, to show me if, if, if I was supposed to have this liberal mindset, if, if I was supposed to basically be a liberal. And it was, again, it was like instantly, it, I mean, just out of nowhere, it was like, boom, the light came on, and it was like, no, these people support abortion and, and all sorts of ungodly things, and it was like the light just came on, and he showed me. But again, before then, people could have looked at me and condemned me. Hey, hey, you're, you're liberal? You know, you're this and that? And condemn me and said, you know what? I can't associate with you, uh, you know, away with you. There's also the issue of Christmas. Um, you know, we grew up celebrating Christmas. And then I started hearing basically people condemning other Christians for celebrating Christmas, saying, oh, it's it's a pagan, you know, it's got pagan origins. You're going to hell if you celebrate this. And so I started looking into it. And yeah, I mean, it does appear that some of it, uh, you, you could trace back some of it, whether loosely or not, you could trace back some of it to pagan origins. So, um, you know, that, that, really, that really started bothering me. So I started looking into it, and I thought, man, are, are people really going to hell for celebrating Christmas? So I started looking into it, and God showed me. He showed me that, I mean, yes, listen, there's clear things. There's clear things in Scripture. Uh, lying is one of them. Covetousness, covetousness is clearly condemned in Scripture. There are certain things that are that are you know worldly lust. These things are explicitly condemned in Scripture. But what I don't see in Scripture is all these little tiny things being micromanaged, um, and and just you know people going around condemning people over every little tiny doubtful thing. And that's what we're going to be talking about. That's what we're going to get into is. Romans 14, Paul tells us, look at this, Paul tells us to receive one who is weak in the faith, but not to dispute over doubtful things. Okay, I'm not talking, again, like with Christmas, I'm not talking about things like outright flagrant sin, okay, outright flagrant covetousness. I'm talking about doubtful things. That's what we're going to be talking about today. All the doubtful things, you know, is it, is it a sin to celebrate Christmas if you're doing it for the Lord? Or if you're celebrating it at all, are you just, are you just bound for hell? Is this really what the Bible teaches? Um, well, let's just look at this. It says, to receive one who is weak in the faith, but not to dispute over doubtful things. So if it's doubtful, if it's, if it's something that's not clearly and explicitly laid out in Scripture, if it's doubtful, Paul says, do not dispute over it, don't, don't dispute over it. Don't, don't condemn your brother. Don't judge your brother over these things that are doubtful. And if we look at the word for uh, disputes, it's this word, uh, I think it's diacrisis, and it means to separate, make a distinction, discriminate. It means to withdraw from one, to desert, to separate oneself in a hostile spirit, to oppose, to strive, dispute, contend. So Paul is saying don't don't strive with your brother on something that's doubtful. Don't contend with your brother. Don't withdraw from your brother. Do you understand that? Do you understand there's so many people that just want to divide and withdraw over every little thing that's not clearly laid out in Scripture, but yet Paul rebukes you and says, do not dispute, do, do not dispute over doubtful things. Don't do it. Don't do it. Unless it's something that's, again, very clear. You know, drunkenness, fornication, you know, you're sleeping with your girlfriend, uh, homosexuality, there's all these, I mean, are there not enough sins that it's just so clear that so many people are doing, even, yes, people that call themselves Christians, why do we need to go hunting and picking for everything that you, you, can, you can kind of tie towards a sin? Oh, well, hey, hey, you had a Christmas tree, you know, it's a pagan origin. Oh, you're going to hell because that's idol worship. Aren't there enough flagrant, outright sins. Aren't, I mean, aren't there enough? The studies reveal that it's over 50% of, I believe, pastors 
who were watching porn. And I mean, if you just think about just, just the outright sins, I mean, are just rampant among professing Christians. Do we really need to do we really need to divide even more than the church is already divided right now? But it means Paul says, do not separate yourself from something that's doubtful. Don't, don't separate from people. Just, just like me. Back when, you know, we weren't homeschooling, um, you know, we, we didn't have adoption really on our radar and that sort of thing. All these different things don't dispute over doubtful things. So let's, let's just go ahead and get into this. Romans 14. Paul goes on to say, For one believes he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats only vegetables. Listen to this. Let not him who eats despise him who does not eat. And let him, let not him who does not eat judge him who eats, for God has received him. If you know there, there's a true brother in the Lord, if you know God has received him, if you know he has a spirit, you know that this brother is preaching holiness, preaching righteousness. He, you know, he's got the right gospel and, and he has a heart for serving the Lord. You know God's received him. And, and listen, you could be like, well, but, he, but he's got this, you know, this thing over here. You know, this doubtful thing, you're going to condemn him over. Well, you know, maybe he's not really a Christian. No, don't do that. Listen, the devil loves to just divide true brothers from one another. But right here, Paul gives us advice. Okay, again, the context is doubtful things, okay? In the context of there being doubtful things, Paul gives us a command, really. He says, let not him who eats despise him who does not eat. So let me just fill something in here. Let, let me just, let's take a movie, for example, okay? Some people will say that uh, watching any movies are just worldly and basically condemn people over it. And depending on what movie it is, listen, there, there are some awful wicked movies, obviously porn movies, okay? That, we're, we're not talking about something just flagrant and outright sinful, okay? But there's, there's things that might be doubtful, right? That's the context. So let's just plug that in here. Let's just plug in an example that we're more familiar with, okay? So let's say that there's a brother condemning another brother for watching a movie that he thinks is, is, is maybe fleshly or worldly or maybe sinful, and he's condemning and judging his brother over it. Okay, let's just plug that in here. It says, let not him who watches a movie, okay, again, we're not talking about flagrant, you know, sinful movies, okay? But let not him who, who watches a movie despise him who does not watch a movie. Okay, so think about this. He's saying that if you, if you watch this movie that's doubtful, and again, it's not flagrant, outright sin, but there's doubt in it. Then, then him, him who watches the movie shouldn't despise the one who doesn't. Just look over at him and go, oh, you know, I can't, I can't believe he's not going to watch this movie. You know, and you have this just, just despising uh, tone and attitude towards your brother who, who won't do it. Oh, I, I can't believe he won't do that. Oh, he, he's just, you know, thinks he's so holy and all this. No, it says, do not despise your brother. But then it says, and let not him who... Again, I'm filling this in. Who does not watch the movie, judge him who does. So he who's not watching the movie, he, so, so the one who thinks that, oh, that's, that's just fleshly and worldly, you know, but it, but it might be doubtful, don't judge him who does, okay? It says, for God has received him. You guys got to remember that we have the Holy Spirit guiding us. If you're, if you're a true born-again believer, you have the Holy Spirit guiding us. Again, I'm not talking about just outright heretics that are in willful, flagrant sin. I'm talking, again, about things that are doubtful. Okay, it says, do not judge him. Don't do it. That's a sin. Do not judge your brother over something that's doubtful because, because maybe you think it's a sin, but maybe God, maybe God has said that it's okay for him. And then he says, who are you to judge another servant? To his own master he stands or falls. Indeed, he will be made to stand, for God is able to make him stand. See, the Holy Spirit is able to make us stand. We don't need a micromanager going around and telling us every little thing that we can and can't do. Again, I'm not talking about outright, flagrant, obvious, willful sin, but I'm talking about going around and just judging everybody for every little issue. You know, 
which Bible translation they read. Oh, oh, you're not reading the King James? Oh, well, hey, you're leading people to hell. I've had people tell me that. And I've had people tell me all sorts of different things, whether, whether it's the jab, flat earth, you know, all these different issues. They want to just be so quick to just condemn. And, 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 they, and they, yes, they use Scripture, or they, they try to loosely tie some Scripture to their pet doctrine to condemn you. But listen, if it's doubtful, don't condemn your brother. Don't judge your brother. He says, who are you to judge another servant? To his own master he stands or falls. So he's going to have to answer to God. And it says, indeed, he will be made to stand for God is able to make him stand. Do you not, do you not believe in the power of the Holy Spirit? Do you not believe in the power of God to open his eyes? Just like my eyes were just instantly open. Think about it. Back, like, again, like the example that I gave in the beginning about homeschool, adoption, it was like God just, people were praying for me, and it was like God just, bam, I mean, my eyes were just opened instantly. Now, this didn't happen probably immediately, I mean, it took some time, but God is able to make me stand. Do you see that? And, and I think a lot of these legalists, a lot of these people go around adding to Scripture, oh, you can't do that, oh, that's a sin, that's sin, that's sin, that's sin, and they just want to condemn everybody for every little thing. Um, I think that's the heart of it. They're, they're not being led by the Spirit because they don't have enough faith in the Spirit to make, it says right here, God is able to make him stand. And yes, I, and I understand what you're going to say, well, well, but somebody who's, who's not reading the King James is walking by the flesh and, you know, oh, so they're not a true Christian. I, I, I know, I know. Listen, just put down whatever you think, again, that isn't completely clear. It, it's not completely clear in Scripture, thou shall read the King, King James Version, okay? Now, I understand that people use Scripture to kind of loosely tie, oh, God preserves his word and this kind of thing. Okay, it doesn't say that you have to read the King James Version, does it? No. See, this is doubtful. This falls under Romans 14. Don't condemn your brother. Don't judge your brother. I mean, I mean, it's just amazing. I, I get this even from subscribers that are, that are, you know, all for me and just providing encouragement and, you know, agreeing with my videos. Some of them will come at me and say, well, you know, hey, I like your videos, but you know what? You don't use a King James. You're making people stumble. I mean, this is this is ridiculous. So you're going to condemn me, and, and people will just divide and just leave. Oh, you know what? I, I, can't, I, can't, I can't contribute to this channel. I can't be around this channel anymore. And they'll leave. They'll divide from me. But Paul says, who are you to judge another servant? Listen, you see me preaching a holiness message. You see me preaching the true gospel of Christ. You see my heart for the Lord. You see that I do this, and I don't, I don't ask for money. Okay? This is, this is a labor of love because God has called me to do this. So who are you to condemn me? Who are you to judge another servant? Is God not able to make me stand? So, so listen, if you really feel that I need to be reading the King James Version, then go to your prayer room. Go to your closet and pray for me. Get on your knees and pray for me. How about that? And then, and then God will reveal it to me. Do you not have enough faith in God that God is able to make me stand? It says right here, Paul says, God is able to make me stand. So don't you think that if this really was an issue leading me to hell, that God would open my eyes just like, just like homeschooling, just like he did with adoption, just instantly open my eyes. Well, I'll tell you what, God has not led me to read the King James Version, or, or I mean, I read it, but to use it. He's led me to use other versions at different times. So, see, we're led by the Spirit. And especially over doubtful things, you don't go around condemning your brother. So Paul goes on. One person esteems one day above another. Another esteems every day alike. This could possibly be talking about the Sabbath. Uh, that's another issue that people love to condemn other Christians over. But this could also be, think about it like this. Think about it like this could be Christmas, okay? One person esteems one day above another. Another esteems every day alike. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. See, you need to have your own mind made up about this. He who observes the day, so we could think about it like this, he who observes Christmas observes it to the Lord. And he who does not observe the day to the Lord, he does not observe it. So if you're not observing Christmas, then okay, fine. If, if, you, if you really feel that that's what God wants you to do, 
then by all means do it. But don't exclude or look down or thumb your nose down or, or, or look down upon anybody else who celebrates Christmas, okay? If they're doing it for the Lord. Now, again, I'm not talking about people who were who are uh, doing outright covetousness, you know, and, and I'm talking, I'm talking clear. I'm not saying, oh, oh, well, he gave him, he gave him, uh, okay, three presents or, you know, well, whatever it is. Like, I'm talking outright covetousness or just something that's, that's clearly sin. Then you don't judge your brother. That's what Paul just got done saying. Don't judge your brother. Don't condemn your brother. If he's doing it for the Lord, then let him observe it to the Lord says, he who eats, eats to the Lord, for he gives God thanks. And he who does not eat to the Lord, he does not eat and gives God thanks. See, if you're doing it to honor the Lord, if you're doing it truly to serve the Lord, not, not to serve idols, okay? See, Paul is talking about your motives here. Your motives are very important. If, if, you're, if you're celebrating Christmas to worship the pagan gods, okay, then yes, that's a big issue. Right, but if you're serving, if, if if you're if you're doing Christmas sincerely, you know you're you're not being covetous, you're not lying to your children about Santa, you know, if you're doing something, if if you if you're doing something for the Lord, then who is somebody to condemn you and judge you for that? If you, if you're truly, honestly doing it for the Lord, do you see that? It's see, it's all about our motives. It's all about it's all about our faith. If if, if we can do it in faith, then who are you to come by? And judge your servant. It says, For none of us lives to himself, and no one dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and rose and lived again, that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. But why do you judge your brother? Or why do you show contempt for your brother? Are, are there those of you out there who show contempt? For your brothers and sisters who maybe celebrate Christmas, or maybe don't read the right Bible translation, or don't homeschool, or don't, you know, aren't adopting, or you know, this or that, or celebrate some some holiday, or just whatever it is, something that's doubtful, something that's not clear in Scripture. Again, that's the context. Romans fourteen, something that's doubtful. Paul says, don't dispute over it. Are, are you showing contempt? Are you looking down on your brother and sister? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then, each of us shall give an account of himself to God. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in our brother's way. Do you know what this is saying? It's saying that we're all going to have to give an account to God. If somebody, if somebody wants to do something and it's not clearly laid out in Scripture, and they have the faith to be able to, to do it, and, and God, they, they truly feel that God it, maybe is calling them to do it or is okay with them doing it, then, then who are you to judge your brother? Okay, we're, we're going to have to all give an account to God. Every one of us, we're going to have to give an account to God. Remember he said that God can make you stand. So if we're going to have to give an account, then, then why, why do you go around condemning people? Why do you condemn people about all these different issues? And, and there's, there's many. I mean, I could go on and on with the list of all these things I've heard people condemn other Christians over. This is, this is sin. This is wrong. Right here, Paul goes on to say, Do you have faith? Have it to yourself before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself and what he approves. Happy. So if you're able to celebrate Christmas, for example, and, and you truly feel that God is okay with you doing it, and you're not, you know, you're not coveting and, and, and doing all this other stuff, and you truly are doing it for the Lord, then happy are you who do not condemn yourself and what you approve. It says you're happy. But, oh, but we have these Christians over here trying to uh, say, oh, no, you shouldn't be happy. No, no, you're, you're going to hell, actually. But he who doubts is condemned if he eats, because he does not eat from faith. For whatever is not from faith is sin. So listen, if you're able to celebrate Christmas from faith, if you truly believe that God has given you the faith to be able to do that and do it unto him, then, then who, who is going to come and condemn you for that? 
It, remember back up there, he says, do not let somebody judge you. Don't do it. Do not judge somebody over this. So it, it, all, it comes down to faith. God is able to make a stand. He can give us the faith, okay, over something doubtful. We, we have to seek God because we're going to stand before him. We're going to give an account of our own lives. So we need to be going to God. Now, listen, so I'm not saying that you can't tell your brother or sister that, that hey, I believe this is wrong, or I believe the King James, uh, you really need to read this, and, and I believe there's dangers. I'm not saying that you can't do that. You can do that. But when it comes to dividing from people, excluding people, looking down on people, showing contempt, judgment, all these different things, you're wrong, you're in sin, it's wrong. We have to do everything in faith, okay? Whatever's not of faith is sin. So happy are you if you don't condemn yourself. Happy are you if you have the faith to be able to do that. Paul actually says that it's the one, uh, the, the one who doesn't have the faith to do that, to do something uh, you know, unto the Lord, then that's actually the one with weak faith. And it says that, hey, listen, we're, we're to accept the one with weak faith, okay? We're, we're to accept them. We're not to dispute with them. Um, we're to accept them, but we're not to despise them, and they're not to judge us. Then Paul goes on to, or no, before this, the context of all this, context of Romans 14, right before it, he was talking about love. That's what it all boils down to. It all boils down to love. That's the fulfillment of the law. You should love your neighbor as yourself. Are you, are you really being long-suffering? Are you really being um, loving to your neighbor? When, when, when you just over something doubtful, oh, oh, divide from you. Oh, can't do it. Oh, I'll have to divide from you. Oh, you know what? You're walking by the flesh over this, you know, doubtful thing. Um, be gone. And, and you just cast them out and that's it. Are you really loving your neighbor? Are you really, again, loving your neighbor, as I explained in, in one of my previous videos, loving your neighbor is more than just speaking truth because you can you cannot speak truth in love, as Paul says in Ephesians. You have to speak truth in love, which means that you can speak truth, but yet not do it in a way that's loving. So it's more than just speaking truth. As 1 Corinthians 13 says, love is patient, it's long-suffering, it's kind, and yes, it, 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 re it doesn't rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices when the truth wins out, but it's also these other things. It's also long-suffering. So where's the long-suffering in, in just condemning somebody and judging them to hell and just writing them off? Well, he's walking by the flesh. We got to cast him out of the church or of the community or whatever. Oh, I got to unsubscribe to him or just, just whatever it is. Where's the long-suffering? It's not walking in love. And listen, those who, who do this, you're in sin. 2 Timothy chapter 2, it says, Flee also youthful lust, but pursue righteousness, faith, love, love, peace, listen to this, peace with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. So if, somebody, if somebody's heart is really for the Lord, you're to, you're to remain in peace with that person. Not, again, not disputing over doubtful things like Paul condemned in Romans 14, but to be in peace. And, and there's going to be, listen, everybody's going to disagree on something, okay? No, nobody that I know of perfectly agrees on everything. I don't know of anybody who does. I, I, I just don't. So we're, that means we're going to have to bear with one another in peace among all those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. And again, I know you're going to say, well, but if they're, reading the, if they're not reading the King James and they don't have a pure heart, or hey, if they don't hold to my, my idea of flat earth or you know, the jab or you know, all these other things or speaking in tongues, then, then, then they must be walking by the flesh. Yeah, yeah. So they, they can easily just get out of this. They can easily trick themselves into thinking, oh, so I don't have to show love. I don't have to show long suffering or have to be in peace with these people. But again, you better be really careful because right here, it's, it goes on to say, but... Avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife. Again, he's saying avoid foolish and ignorant disputes. Like, oh, you're going to hell if you don't read the right Bible translation, or all these different things. Right here, Titus 3 says, but avoid foolish disputes, genealogies, contentions, and strivings about the law for they are unprofitable and useless. Reject a divisive man after the first and second admonition, 
knowing that such a person is warped and sinning, being self-condemned. These people that go around and they're just so quick to just divide from somebody. You know, oh, oh, well, you're, you're a heretic over this. You're, you're, you're a heretic. Just constant dividing, no long suffering, and they're just constantly f- disputing about foolish things. You know, wh- whether, it's, whether it's flat earth or whatever it is, they're just constantly disputing. See, in a lot of these things, what, what the devil's doing is they're getting, they're getting them off of the gospel, the main message of the gospel, right? I mean, that's exactly what they're doing. They're, they're, the devil is getting a lot of these people's minds so hyper-focused on, you know, one issue. They have their little pet issue over here that everybody's going to hell if they don't believe the earth is flat, or everybody over here is going to hell, um, you know, because they celebrate Christmas, or everybody over here is going to hell because, you know, whatever, because they don't homeschool or, you know, I mean, just all these different things. And what I've noticed is these people have a hyper-focus. They're always going around trying to talk to people about their issue. Oh, hey, hey, have you, have you researched about the earth being flat? I mean, they're, just, they're, they're always hyper-focused on that. And their mind is being distracted from a pure and sincere devotion to Christ, to Christ, not, 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 the, not the flat earth doctrine, but Christ. That's what's happening. There's so many people that their minds are getting distracted from the, from the gospel. Listen, just stick to the gospel message. We, we, don't, need, we don't need more division. This, this message that we preach, the gospel that we preach, the, the narrow and difficult road that we preach, is already going to be divisive enough. Why, why on earth do you want to make more divisions than are absolutely necessary? That's what it comes down to. Listen, out of love for your brother, you want to be patient. You want to be long-suffering. You, you want to make sure that, that if, you're, if you're dividing from somebody or if you're saying that somebody's going to hell over something, you better be absolutely sure. And I mean, that's a scary thing. It says right here that that rejected device of man after the first second admonition, knowing that such a person is warped and sinning, being self-condemned. You can be self-condemned and sinning if you're if you're a divisive man, or uh, I think another translation of that says if you're a heretic. Okay, so a heretic is just somebody who who divides from orthodoxy. We have to give, we have to give, uh, first of all, we have to give more credit to the Spirit than that, especially for, for true believers who are, who are honestly seeking to honor the Lord. The Spirit is going to be working in them, and, and they can do the same thing to them as, they, as, 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 as the Spirit did to me. The Holy Spirit can do the same thing to them as He did to me. When it's just like a light bulb comes on, somebody's praying for me, and then out of nowhere, I'm just like, of course, that's what I need to be doing. So second, we need to bear with one another, especially, you know, new Christians. There's going to be new Christians out there that haven't had um, their senses exercised to discern both good and evil, like it says in Hebrews 5, because they're still a babe in Christ. There's many people out there that are still just babes in Christ. So we got to be patient. We got to be long-suffering. We can't just be so quick to condemn and divide. Um. And also, even, even those who, who were more solid in the faith, I mean, you know, maybe they haven't had their senses exercised to discern both good and evil like you have, okay? You know, the Lord's been patient with you, correct? I mean, did, did you, when you first came to Christ, you just knew everything right away, and you believed everything, you know, second somebody, um, second somebody told you about something, it was just instantaneous, and no, there... People had to work with you. And if you think about it, the people who had the biggest impact on you were those who were patient, who were kind, who, who didn't just, oh, you believe that? Oh, you're condemned, done with you. <laughs> I mean, I mean, really, the, the people that had the biggest impact on you were the people that were patient and told you the truth, yes, but told it to you in love. They, they genuinely wanted the best for you. And that's really what it comes down to. Do you truly and genuinely want what's best for somebody? That's, that's really what it is. Love does no wrong. Love fulfills the law. So you have to ask yourself, are, are you truly doing what's, what's in somebody's best interest by, by casting them out over, over a, a relatively small issue or an issue that maybe you think is a sin, um, that that's, that's your opinion, but there's doubt in there. It, it's doubtful, like Paul says, Romans 14, in the beginning, 
It says, don't dispute over things that are doubtful. Uh, James, it says that God gives grace to the humble. So, so we have to humble ourselves. You know, what if we're wrong on something? What if, what if we're wrong? What if, what if we've been condemning over something? We've been condemning people over something, and we find out that, wait, I wasn't supposed to be condemning that person. I mean, think about that. How, how scary of a thing is that? For you to condemn somebody over something when you never should have condemned that person. I mean, think about that. And, and yes, if you're dividing from somebody and you say, oh, no, I can't have anything to do with you, then what, sh- what you're essentially doing is, you know, especially if you're kicking them out of the fellowship and, and basically saying, nope, nope, you're walking by the flesh and this and that, and, and you just won't talk to them, then what are you doing? You're, you're dividing the body of Christ. You're just creating another schism, another sect, another denomination, so to speak. I mean, look at how many denominations there are right now. It just keeps going and going and going. And even in the holiness community, there's just more division, more division. Oh, well, you don't do things quite like I see it and, and this and that. It's got to stop. But God gives grace to the humble. So, so let's humble ourselves and say, wait a minute. You know what? For something that's doubtful, maybe, just maybe, since it's doubtful, maybe, I'll just give you the benefit of the doubt out of love and say, you know what? There's, there's a small chance, e- even if it's a small chance, there's a small chance I could be wrong on this. I'm going to be patient. I'm going I'm to love you. I'm going to bear with you on this and not divide from you. And you know what? I'll speak truth in love, okay? But, but I'm not going to just constantly berate you with it and that kind of thing. I'm going to speak truth and be kind and that, that sort of thing. I mean, listen, we're supposed to be gentle and kind to our brothers and sisters. You know, those who are, those who are truly in Christ, be gentle and kind and, and be long-suffering, okay? Don't just beat somebody over the head constantly, time and time again, over your little pet doctrine. But then James goes on to say, after saying, okay, God gives grace to the humble, but resist the proud. Then he goes on and says, do not speak evil of one another, brethren. He who speaks evil of a brother and judges his brother speaks evil of the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and destroy. Who are you to judge another? This kind of goes back to Paul when he was saying, who are you to judge your brother over something that's doubtful? Now, now listen, if you, if you think something is a sin, okay, and let's say you're not going to condemn somebody over it, but if you think it's a sin and you still do it anyways, then that's not a faith, and that would be sin for you. That's, that's the argument that Paul makes in Romans 14, that if you do something even though you doubt and you still do it anyway. So, so let's say, for example, Christmas. Let's say, let's say you're truly 100% convinced that it's pagan and that you would actually be worshiping idols if you celebrated Christmas. Well, then for you, I would tell you, don't do it. Don't celebrate Christmas. Just stay away from it, okay? For you, I would tell you not to do that. Why? Because you'd be hurting your conscience. You'd be going against your conscience. If I said, if I said, hey, you, so so you who truly believes that Christmas would be a sin and worshiping idols, you know what? You better just do it anyways. And if that person just goes, okay, well, I guess, all right, I guess I'll, I'll just go ahead and do it anyways, even though I think it's a sin. No, then you would actually be sinning because you'd be violating your conscience. No, don't do that. And that wouldn't be loving of me to say that to you, to say, hey, you must celebrate Christmas or you must, you know, get a tree or, or whatever if you tr- if it truly went against your conscience. But remember, he said that one isn't supposed to despise the other and the other isn't supposed to judge the other one. Again, for something that's doubtful. But James is saying right here that we need to humble ourselves and not judge our brother, not speak evil of our brother. Again, this isn't just talking about heretics out there that are just in flagrant willful sin, but we need to be careful not to speak evil of our brother and judge our brother. We need to humble ourselves. These are, these are strong warnings against, um, you know, yes, not only hypocritical judgment, but also unrighteous judgment. Okay, we have to be sure that we're judging righteously. And right here, Galatians, um, it says, for all the laws fulfilled in one word, even in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. 
But if you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be consumed by one another. And this is what's happening. Just to be honest, this is what's happening in the holiness community. I, I see it really everywhere. It doesn't matter if it's a holiness community or whatever else. I mean, there, there are people just backbiting and just causing divisions and just, you know, separating from one another. Oh, I can't talk to brother so-and-so because he's, you know, because he does this. He uses these kind of words, and I don't really like that. I don't think that's good. And this brother over here, well, well see, see, I don't like that, uh, that he doesn't wear head covering, so I can't, you know, it's just, come on, if it's doubtful, do not judge your brother. And judging, judging, as Paul says, I believe it's in 1 Corinthians 5, judging is casting somebody out. It, it can be not only um, judging somebody by, you know, thoughts and, and your words, but it could also be, judgment could also mean casting somebody out and dividing from somebody. That that could be judgment. Remember when he says to cast the, the one who was just in flagrant willful sin, who was sleeping with his um, stepmom? He said, cast him out. And he said that he's already made a judgment against him. That was a judgment. So he judged him by casting him out. So that's that's a form of judging. And we need to be careful, like James says, humble ourselves, make sure we're not unrighteously judging our brother and speaking evil of our brother when God accepts him. Remember, like when Paul said, Romans 14, who are you to judge someone, your brother, when God accepts him? If he's doing it by faith and you come along and, oh, no, you know what? You can't do that. Beware lest you be consumed by one another. You know, the measure you use, if, if you're harsh and just so critical and you're just so um, quick to just cast somebody out and quick to judge somebody, then guess what? Jesus says that whatever measure you use, that's going to be measured back to you. So that could be talking about Jesus himself, but it could also mean if you treat people harsh and you're so quick to separate and divide from them, then guess what? You're going to get the same thing back. People are going to be harsh just a matter of time. People are going to end up being harsh and dividing from you as soon as you don't see things exactly their way. Now, think about it. These people who are so divisive, these tend to be very lonely people. They, they think that maybe it's just like them and maybe one other person who has it right in the whole world, you know? I mean, is, that, is, that really, is that really what you think? Because the Bible says that there's going to be prophets, evangelists, all these different people in the body. And a lot of these churches and gatherings out there, they may just have a few people. They, they certainly don't have all these different gifts in the church that Paul says, you know, this is, this is really what edifies the church, all these different gifts that are being used by all sorts of different people. Okay, Paul cast the guy out who was sleeping with his uh, mother-in-law, or, or, or stepmom, sorry. Um, but yes, again, that was flagrant, obvious. He said... The pagans don't even do this. This is something so clearly against Scripture that even, even pagans just know by their, by their conscience this is wrong. Okay, you, you, you don't need... This is definitely not doubtful, he's basically saying. This is by no means doubtful. So yes, I'm going to judge him by kicking him out. But notice how Paul doesn't kick anybody else out. He, he doesn't go through and, and nitpick every little tiny thing. And, oh, you believe this? Okay, well, you got to get out too. I mean, people were even... We're even getting drunk and not discerning the body, and God was judging them. Okay, God was sending sickness and even killing some of them, but He didn't go through and cast them out. He didn't go through and cast people out who were who were um, <clears throat> who were uh, suing their brothers and sisters. No, He He warned them. He said, "Listen, you're going to have to answer to God, and, and and if you're if you're doing these things, if you're covetous, if you're fornicating, sexually immoral, all these things, you will go to hell. Let there be no doubt." But he wasn't so quick to just cast everybody out who who he he disagreed with or you know he thought was doing anything wrong. No, he he warned them, he rebuked them out of love, but he he didn't go around and just automatically kick everybody out for everything he saw. Okay. So if you do this, if you have this mindset, it says, Paul says, beware lest you be consumed by one another. If you're just constantly biting and devouring one another. And again, it really just comes down to love. You should love your neighbors yourself. Would you want somebody being so harsh and critical of you for something, let's say, if you didn't agree on head coverings? Oh, oh, you don't agree on head coverings? Oh, you're out, you know? Or, or vice versa. Let's say the shoe was on the other foot. Would, would you want somebody 
so to be so harsh and critical and just cast you out like a like a pagan, you know, just without mercy, without any long suffering, without any love, just ca- is this what you want? The law is you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You should love your brother as yourself, right? Is this how you'd want to be treated? Or would you want somebody to come to you, you as a true brother in Christ, come to you and, and do it in gentleness, do it in respect, do it in, you know, out of, out of a true and genuine concern over you. And there's a difference. You know, you can tell people who just, who don't really have a concern, it's just, you know, their way or the highway, you know, they, they really don't have a concern over you. They just want to, they just want to tell you, you know, they just want to be right and tell you what you're doing wrong and then get out of there if you don't agree. That's not love. Love, yes, it speaks truth, but it goes after it's long suffering, it's patient, it's kind, gentle. This is what you need to be to your brother because this is what you would want someone to be to you. You'd want someone to come to you in gentleness and meekness and humility, all these things, not just in harshness and just, you know, hey, I don't agree with this and you know what? You either agree or get out. <laughs> um, Colossians. Th- this is how Paul instructs us to behave as believers. Therefore, as the elect of God, so if you think you're an elect of God, holy and beloved, Paul tells you this. Put on tender mercies. Tender mercies. Do you, do you see that? Not, not, not a harsh mercy, not, 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 a, not a harshness, it's a tender mercy. This, this, again, this is talking about fellow brothers. Kindness, humility, meekness, long suffering. Now, is kicking somebody out just after maybe, uh, you know, one or two uh, encounters, you know, just really quick? Oh, oh, you don't see things my way? You, you don't have the same opinion as me? Oh, well, you're out. Is that really loving? Is that really long suffering? Is that, like Paul says, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. Is that really being humble and kind and putting on tender mercies? Paul says, if anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, you so you also must do. You know, Christ is very patient. He's very patient. He's long suffering. And and that's what I think a lot of holiness preachers don't get. They they don't they don't really preach on this. You don't really hear this. But man, He's long suffering. He's patient. And this reminds me, I, and, and I've done this for two years now, and you think I would have learned the first time. But a few years back, I had this tomato plant. I've been growing tomatoes in my in my little garden that I have. And I pruned the daylights out of this plant. Okay. It looked like there were a lot of a lot of branches that just needed to be cut off. And I mean, I pruned like at least half of the branches off. And you know what it did? It stopped bearing fruit. It, it just completely stopped. Um, I mean, it maybe just bore a little bit after that, but it was probably just because it already was going to bear that anyways. But it basically, it, it killed, effectively, it killed the tomato plant. And, you know, it's interesting that God uses, in John 15, he uses this illustration of, of him pruning. You know, he says that he'll prune you um, so that you bear more fruit. But he doesn't do this instantly, and he doesn't do it harshly. He does it tenderly, does it with long suffering. I mean, think, think about you. Think about you. Did, did Jesus just prune you immediately of every single thing? Immediately. Like the first day you came to him, okay, I'm just going to cut this off. Okay, you're watching these kind of movies. You're doing this. You're doing this. Okay, I'm just going to cut all this off. You can't do any of this. If you do it tomorrow, I'm done with you. No. He, he was long, you know he was long suffering with you. If, if you truly met the Lord, you know that's not true. You know he's been long. You know it was a it was a it was a process where you 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 came to the truth little by little, and that's what he does. He he works on you. Okay, now let's deal let's deal with the movie selection that you're you know, or, or even maybe you shouldn't be watching movies at all. Maybe you should be you know. Um, I mean, there's a lot of people that just sit around and waste time. They should be fruitful. Okay, so I'm not saying that you should just hey go out and watch movies if they're as long as they're not sinful. You should just watch all the movies. No, we got to be fruitful. or We're going to be cut off, but. Christ, you know, how he's dealt with me, and I know how he's dealt with a lot of other people, is he, he works with you, he's patient, he, he's a good teacher, he, he works with you, okay, so let's talk about the movies that you're watching, okay, let's deal with this, well, let's, let's start to prune this, okay, then he works with you on that, okay, then he's tender with you, he, he's, he's merciful, 
He comes to you in love and kindness and gentleness and meekness, right? The fruit of the Spirit. And then, then he, he prunes it off you. But then now does he just immediately, you know, just prune like 15 other things off at the same time? No, because you'll kill it. And for some reason, and, and I, knew, I knew not to do this. I knew not to do it. But for some reason, I did it again this year. I had two tomato plants that I just, I pruned the daylights out of. I'm talking, I pruned, for some reason, I decided to prune 50% or more of the leaves off it. And guess what? They, they pretty much, they're pretty much done for the season. <laughs> I mean, I don't know why I did it again. It, probably for God just to teach me this lesson. That's probably why. He just, I don't know, maybe he blinded my eyes to where I couldn't see it, and I just did it again. And uh, it effectively took these plants out. And now I'm not going to get near as much fruit, if, if, if a whole lot more at all. So that's the lesson, guys. Listen, we, we, we got to be patient as Jesus is patient with people. We don't just come up to somebody, especially somebody who's new in the faith or whatever, and, and just immediately, okay, we got to prune all these things off right now. No, we work with them. Okay, we, we come to them in humility. Again, I'm not talking about I'm not talking about flagrant outright sin. Okay, I'm not I'm not saying that we should slowly cut off things that are just willful outright sins. Like, uh, you know, if they're if they're literally worshiping Muhammad or something like that, and fornicating and doing all these other things, I'm not saying okay, let's slowly work on. No, no, Jesus frees you from your sin, frees you from these these sins that have you bound. Okay, then we're supposed to renew our mind after that. And there's all these maybe doubtful things, or maybe things that might even be sin that, that, uh, but that aren't as obvious. You know, I mean, when you first come to Christ, so many people have these testimonies. They're freed from, let's say, heroin addiction, long-term heroin addiction, and, and worshiping other gods, and, and all these things, they just shut off immediately. Like, God just frees them immediately, and they repent of these. But there still may be movie choices that they, maybe movies they shouldn't really be watching, or maybe... Um, you know, all these different things that maybe they shouldn't be doing, but God's going to prune them so they bear more fruit. And guess what? I mean, you look it up, you look it up. If you prune a tree too much, it'll kill it. It'll kill it. So that's the analogy that Jesus uses. So why wouldn't he be the same with us? You know, he's not going to prune us all immediately, but he's going to prune us just enough to where we'll still continue to bear fruit, right? He's not going to prune every single thing all at once. But, you know, little by little, he's a good teacher. He's, he's patient with us. Okay, now we got to work on this. See, God is able to make us stand like Paul says, Romans 14. God is able to make you stand. The Holy Spirit is going to lead you and guide you, and he's going to make you stand. So don't, don't let anybody just come up and condemn you over every little thing. Again, I'm not talking about Things that are obvious sins. But right here. Anyways, let's continue. Uh, but above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. See, love bonds us together. I, and I, I know this sounds like, oh, he's talking about love. He's getting into all this hippie stuff. And, you know, he's just getting into unity. And he's just going to be wanting to unite with all these heretics. No. this I'm just reading the Bible. Okay, I'm just reading the Bible. Paul says, but above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. Listen, we're not all going to agree. It's just not going to happen on every little thing. And I'm going to show you that here in a minute. I'm going to prove that to you that we're not all going to agree. But then he says, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which you also were called in one body, in one body, one body, and be thankful. This is, this is what we're supposed to be doing. Forgiving, coming to each other in kindness, humility, meekness. Uh, above all these, putting on love that bonds us together. Ephesians 4 says, With all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love. Well, okay, let me ask you this. Why would you need to bear with each other if you all had the same uh, ideas, the same opinions, the same beliefs about Scripture? What, what, what would be the point in bearing with one another? You would automatically bear with them because everybody believed the same thing as you. No, Paul knows that in Ephesus, there were people that didn't believe all the same thing. That's why he says, bearing with one another, endeavoring, which means striving. You're, you're, you're giving all diligence. You know, 
when it says to be diligent to present yourself approved, rightly dividing the word of truth, that being diligent there, that's the same word, endeavoring, you're being diligent. When Peter says be diligent to make, make your calling and election sure, or to be diligent to add these things to your faith, he's talking about, it's the same word here, endeavoring, you're striving, you're being diligent to keep the unity of the spirit of the bond of peace. Well, why would you need to, to strive to keep unity if, if you just automatically all believe the same things? See, it's not, it's just not the case. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling. Again, I'm not giving, I'm not giving a license for every heretic out there just to believe whatever he wants. It's not, that's not what we're talking about. He's talking about people you know God has accepted. You know who have a have a true passion and a heart for the Lord. And you see the spirit moving in their life, right? You, you've seen the spirit fall on them, you know? You you've seen God orchestrating things in their life. God has, uh, you know, just just done things in their life that you see the Spirit moving, right? Right here, he goes on, Ephesians 4. This is proof that we're not all going to have the same exact beliefs. Paul says, And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till... Did you see that? Till. That means we're not there yet until we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. So what this means is we're not there yet. We're not all unified. We're not, we don't all have the same knowledge and we're not all perfectly unified. He says that he's given these offices of pastor, teacher, prophet, apostle, evangelist, till we all come to the unity of the faith. Do you, do you see that? That means that we're not all unified in the faith. And Paul doesn't say, hey, you know what? Everybody who's not unified with you, you need to kick them out. <laughs> no. So what do you do? You teach them. Right here, that's one of the fivefold ministry right here. Teachers, you teach them till we all come to the unity of the faith. That means that there's going to be this time where we're not all unified. We don't all believe the same thing. But you keep teaching, you keep being patient, long-suffering, till they we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. To a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So we keep doing this. We keep being long-suffering, patient, until everybody becomes perfect. Do, do you see that? Until. So you keep laboring. You keep preaching the truth in love. You keep bearing with your brother, forgiving him, being patient and meek and gentle, until everybody comes to the full knowledge, full unity, perfect man, to the fullness of Christ. That we should no longer be children, tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine. See, that means that there's people, even in Ephesus, that they had people that probably were being carried around in these, in every wind of doctrine. Maybe some were heretical doctrines. Maybe some were, were, were doctrines that, you know, Many people would feel they have to divide from. But listen, he says that we're supposed, we have all, all these different um, offices to teach and to equip and encourage until we become unified in faith. And there's going to be people who are going to be tossed to and fro, carried about with everyone in doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love. Again, love is more than just speaking truth because you have to speak the truth in love. 1 Corinthians 13, love is patient. Love is kind. Okay? Speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. Do you see that? Then 1 Peter says, Finally, all of you, all of you Christians... All of you be of one mind, one mind, having compassion for one another. Love as brothers, be tenderhearted, be courteous. Are, are you these things? Just, just ask yourself for a second. Are, are, can you genuinely say, those who you disagree with, those brothers in the Lord, 
who you just disagree with. You may even think they're going to hell for for an issue that you think that that your opinion is that they're walking by the flesh or, oh, my opinion is this is idolatry. My opinion, you know, I think that Scripture says this is sin, or I think, but, you know, but 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 there's some doubt in there. Remember Paul says for something that's doubtful? If, 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 there's, if there's reasonable doubt in there, and, and you're going to be so quick to judge and condemn your brother, does this describe you? Are you, are you of one mind? Are you, do you have compassion for each other? Do you love his brothers? Are you tender-hearted? Are, just, just ask yourself that. Are you, are you tender-hearted? Are you courteous? Wow, imagine that. Yes, you have to be courteous. I know, I know in the holiness community, courteousness is not, is not often uh, preached about, but right here it is. I'm just reading the Bible. Love, there, yes, there's love, there's unity, and yes, we can't just unify. Like I said, I'm not just saying that we unify with, with everybody and anybody, okay? I'm not saying that. But you can't deny right here that he says, until, till we all come to the unity of the faith. Do you see that? Till. So, so if you say, if you say till, so um, let's say till I get to LA. Okay. So, so I'm flying till I get there, I'm going to uh, listen to music or something like that. That means you're not there yet. That means you're not in LA yet. Okay. It says until you get there. And Paul was writing this to a church. So obviously he's saying that you're not all unified yet. Some of you are being tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. But what you need to do, this is what you need to do. You need to uh, have, these, have these teachers, these pastors, these prophets, apostles, evangelists, until you all come to unity. Okay? And you need to do this by speaking the truth in love so that you may grow up into all things, into him who is the head Christ. So, so, so until you get there, until you get there, you need to be tender-hearted. You need to be kind. You need to be gentle, patient, having tender mercies, being courteous to one another, having compassion for one another. You know, truly loving your brother as you as, as you would want somebody to love you. This is just this is just so such an important issue. This is just so neglected in in a lot of the holiness circles. Because they, they really just see this, a lot of people just see this as like, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, all that lovey-dovey stuff. No, this is, this is something that's talked about. I just gave you scripture after scripture after scripture of being tender-hearted, the fruit of the Spirit. What is the fruit of the Spirit? Gentleness. It includes gentleness, right? Kindness. So think about this. We're not, we're not quite all unified yet. But pray for somebody. Okay, in, in 1 John, at the end of 1 John, it talks about that there's sin leading to death, okay? And it says that for, for people doing sins to death, okay, so for these obvious, you know, fornication, obvious idolatry, not, not something that you might think, in your own opinion, might be idolatry. I'm talking about, you know, just if you look throughout the Old Testament, when they committed idolatry, it wasn't something that was usually kind of iffy. It was like, no, they actually went back to worshiping, uh, like for example, in the Exodus, they actually made a golden calf, okay? They actually made a golden calf. They, they, didn't, just, they, they didn't just celebrate Christmas to honor God or something like that, okay? This is not the same thing, but they actually worshiped an idol. That's what I'm talking about. So for those things that, are, that lead to death, he sa- John says, I don't say you should pray for that. But for there is sin not leading to death. And the, the insinuation is, pray for somebody. Pray for that. Okay, listen, if you see somebody who is, let's say, they're not homeschooling their children, just like somebody prayed for us, you pray for them and let the Spirit reveal it to them. It's not going to help you just beating them over the head and you not being uh, peaceful with them and you just creating disputes and contentions and divisions and just not being tender-hearted and not being gentle and all that to your brother, to your brother who, I mean, we're saved by love, right? We're saved by faith working through love. And what's the commandment? That you should love your brother, your brother. Well, what is love? We've just been over this so many times. It's being gentle, tender-hearted, tender mercies, 
uh, courteous, all these different things to your brother, to, to your brother in the Lord. Yes, even if you don't, if you're not unified in, in the same um, level of faith, okay? So you're supposed to have compassion, but, but pray for them, and God will open their eyes. It says, again, Paul says that he, God is able to make you stand. God is able to make you stand, but who are you to judge your brother? Who are you to condemn your brother? Who are you to, to look down and despise your brother? Think about it. These people who, who go around causing these divisions, Titus talks about these people. He says they're, they're, they're self-condemned, okay? We need to be careful that we're not those people. We, we need to keep the gospel message front and center, front and center, okay? The, the, listen, the world is, is desperately needing the true gospel of Christ. The Christian community is desperately needing the true gospel of Christ. So, so how... So, so how, how can we reach them if we as, as holiness preachers are constantly uh, being divisive and not unifying for a common goal? The common goal is the gospel. Listen, if you preach, if you preach the same gospel, you're my brother, okay? I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna divide from you from every little for every little issue. Every little issue that's just, oh, oh, that's not really, you know, that's not really what I believe, so we can't fellowship. You know, you, you got to go find another fellowship. That's absolutely unbiblical. That's not loving your brother. That's not bearing with one another, endeavoring to keep the unity of the, of the spirit of the bond of peace. I hope that, I hope that this impacts some of you out there. I hope this, this impacts everybody. I mean, this is so crucial. Again, we're saved by faith, working through love. Make sure you're actually loving your brother. Look up again what it means to truly love your brother. Pray for them. Uh, just, just like, just like it, people have opened my eyes by praying for me, do the same for them. Pray for your brothers and sisters. That's all I got for today. God bless.